Philippians uh, for beginners, this is lesson number three, Paul's condition, and we're going to cover Philippians chapter one, verses 12 to 26. So in 60 to 62 AD, while in a Roman prison, Paul writes a letter to the church at the city of Philippi, a group for which he had much affection. He's thankful not only for the support that they have provided him over the years, but also for their continued faith and progress in Christ. He's a preacher, he's a minister. He wants the church to grow and to develop, so he's glad when he hears of their progress. In this letter, he's going to encourage them to mature in Christ, and he's going to provide them with six examples of Christian maturity that they can emulate in their own lives. Before getting to this, you know, the, the, the thick, uh, meaty part of this uh, epistle, however, uh, Paul will inform them of his own present condition and circumstances. After all, it's a letter. He's sending a letter. And so he, you know, he greets them and does all that, prays for them, and then he, he wants to tell them a little bit about what's going on with him before he gets into the main part of his, uh, his teaching. And so um, we begin with uh, chapter one, uh, verse 12. He says, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So here Paul describes both the bad and the good of his situation. And you're going to see it's the good and the bad and the good and the bad. You know, he goes through what's good and what's bad about what's happening to him. Um, and that's where he begins uh, explaining, not only where, but how he begins explaining his uh, current situation. So he starts with the bad. He assumes that his readers are aware of the circumstances of his imprisonment and its uh, injustice. I mean, think about it. He was arrested for no cause. He was kept in prison without any charges being laid against him. He was transferred to Rome as a criminal and he was put in jail for an additional two years waiting for his hearing. So now we're talking about almost four years in prison, no crime, no, no active, nothing. So all of this he refers to as his quote condition. He's, I'm sure you're aware of my quote condition. That's the bad. However, it's not all bad. There's some good says, despite what could have limited the progress of the gospel, think about it, he is the apostle to the Gentiles. He is the major individual who's going around planting churches in the Roman Empire. This was his task. This was the ministry he was given by Christ. And so now he's been in jail for almost four years. So he's saying, despite my, quote, circumstances, you know, that I'm limited, I can't be out there preaching and establishing churches, so on and so forth. Nevertheless, he said, the gospel somehow just keeps on going. So it's not all bad, okay? The gospel prospers nevertheless. Why? Well, because God is the one that, you know, that gives it you know, power. God is the one that pushes the gospel on. We're, we're servants. So then he says, you know, he said there was the bad, there was the good, here, now the bad again. In verse 13, he says, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. While he's in the rented house that he had only one guard and that was changed daily. We read about that in Acts 28, verse 16. So at the beginning when he was brought to Rome, he was put in a rented quarters something like house arrest, and there was just one guard you know, that was on a rotation guarding him. Some believe, however, according to this, this passage here, that he was then transferred to the guard room of the Praetorian Guard, um, whose offices were located in the emperor's palace. So the closer he got to his trial date, they switched him. They took him out of the house arrest and they put him in the jail where the court was which was more jail than apartment, okay? That's the point here. This would explain his contact uh, with and his in influence on the Praetorian Guard as they witnessed and heard the discussions and the prayers and the teachings of Paul and those who visited and stayed with him and talked about these things 
among themselves. You know, the guys guarding you, they're hearing what you're saying. They're, they're, you know, you're not necessarily a dangerous criminal. You're not there because you murdered somebody or something like that. You're, you're kind of a political guy. People talk, people share. And so as the guards watched and learned and listened and conversed, somehow they brought that message and shared with others. So the bad was that he was transferred into a you know, less comfortable jail. But there was good in this. The fact that Paul was to appear in what uh, Linsky, the commentator says, he, he, he called it the Supreme Court of the world in order to explain and defend the gospel and his role in preaching it. Think about that for a second. This was no ordinary courtroom and he was not going to be in front of just any old judge. He was going to be in front of the emperor, the most powerful person in the entire world. And the people that were going to be in that courtroom, they weren't the rabble, they weren't you know, the peasants. The people who were in that courtroom listening were the high and the mighty of the Roman Empire. Think about that for a second. So Paul gets to go and explain the gospel and defend the gospel and proclaim the gospel to the most powerful people in the Roman Empire. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's an opportunity that he could not have managed himself. You know, you think he could have gone to Rome and knocked on the door and said, excuse me, I'd like to have a visit with the emperor. <laughs> he was a nobody as far as that was concerned. And so all things worked in such a way to bring him right there in front, face to face, with the most powerful people in the Roman Empire. And of course, this particular thing had been spoken of by Jesus himself, right? In Luke 12, Jesus said when they, speaking to his apostles, he says, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. And so Paul now is going to be in front of the rulers and the authorities, and he has the promise from Jesus, don't worry about what you're going to say. I'll be there with you. In Luke 21, 12 and 13, again, Jesus says, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you, speaking of the apostles, and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. Whoa, hang on a second. Here's Jesus telling the apostles exactly what Paul will, will do. He is brought to prison and then in front of the authorities to do what? To proclaim the gospel to that person. And then once again in Acts 9, 13, 14, Ananias, he's the one that preached the gospel to Paul. Okay? So Ananias is, is talking to the Lord. The Lord is saying, I want you to go and you know, preach the gospel to this Saul guy. And Ananias is saying, Saul, you want me to go to him? This guy's killing Christians. So this is what this is about. So but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, meaning Saul, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who will call on your name. Listen to what Jesus says. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So, Nothing like this and no one like Paul had ever appeared before Caesar. This was to be an event and it had those involved talking about what would happen. This was a big deal. This included the Praetorian Guard. A little bit about this, this group, this very special group of guards. Uh, they were the emperor's guard, personal guard, the imperial guard. This guard consisted of nine cohorts with a thousand men in each cohort, according to Tacitus, a Roman historian. Um, each man was handpicked. You didn't volunteer, you were chosen. Uh, and had to be of Italian birth, no foreigners. 
They received double pay and special privileges. Each soldier ranked as a centurion when serving with regular legions. So when they were dispatched to go with the legions, their rank was centurion. They were over 100 uh, people automatically. And of course, they wielded great influence in the state. So through the guards' involvement and interest, the information about Paul and the gospel spread throughout this elite section of the Roman military and beyond to the cities, uh, citizens of Rome because these people had families, they had wives, they had children, they had relatives. So this is the progress that Paul speaks of and as he will mention later, rejoices in. Are you kidding? He thought he was in jail, he thought he was done, he thought you know, uh, you know, uh, the gospel has been blocked and then he finds out how much influence he's having. God always shows us that you know, through our weakness, He shows His strength. When we are weak, He shows how strong He is. So you know, the, that was the bad, the bad, the idea that He was in prison, so on and so forth. So, uh, uh, and then the good, the good was that things were happening anyways. And then another good thing is happening. Verse 14, he says, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So another good thing is happening. His continued proclamation of the gospel despite his imprisonment, along with the interest in his case by no less than the elite Praetorian Guard, emboldened other Christians to speak out. So it seems that as the trial grew near, Paul's vindication and freedom appeared to be assured. The fact that Paul would be released and the gospel not outlawed as a result of this gave the many Christians in Rome the courage to proclaim the gospel publicly and to do so without the fear that they would be arrested for it. I mean, think about it. Your religious leader's in jail and he's in jail for what he's been saying. How much courage does that give you to share the gospel with your neighbor or maybe start a, a, a study group or a prayer group? Uh-uh, you know, people are hiding out, people are laying low. But as the news of Paul's impending freedom is coming out, the fact that even the elite military knows about the gospel, some of them may even be converted gives courage to you know, ordinary Christians throughout the city. Well, you know, looks like uh, he's going to make it, looks like he's not going to be arrested, look, uh, uh, he's not going to be executed, and our religion will not be outlawed. So you know, they gave him fresh courage to get out there and share their faith and, and be more bold, if you wish. So if Paul pled his case for the gospel successfully before Caesar and was then freed, they could confidently begin to preach publicly without fear of persecution from the Roman government. So that was like a good thing. Okay? All these things, God is just working all these things. Okay? Then he goes from a good thing to a bad thing. In verse 15 he says, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense uh, of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me dis distress in my imprisonment. So uh, among the Gentiles, among the Romans, uh, there's some good news that many of them are you know, receiving the gospel, talking about it, and so on and so forth. Now within the church, among Christians, there's bad news in the sense that there's trouble taking place and he describes it here. He turns his attention from the guards, as I said, and the trial he believes will go in his favor to the reaction of believers and how his imprisonment has affected them. And he describes two groups who are involved in similar pursuits, but they have different motivations. One group, he says in verse 14, who have been motivated by Paul's imprisonment and the interest in the gospel that it has caused, uh, this has um, enabled them to become more courageous in their preaching to their neighbors and to others in the city. 
They're motivated by their love for Paul as their teacher and their example for Christ. Think about it, your leader's there. Man, if he can do this, if he can be in prison and be bold and so on and so forth, surely I can do this. Surely I can do something. Their motives, Paul says, are pure. Preaching from you know, goodwill. In that the reason that they preach is to save souls and not to make personal gain. They're not in it for the money. They're not in it for any type of power. They just want to share the gospel, save souls. They, these people here that are preaching with a good, motiva a good motivation, they see the situation through the eyes of faith. Paul is not just some other prisoner, but he's part of God's greater plan to bring the gospel to the entire world. They get this, they see this, they're part of this. So some people you know, are simply sharing the faith because it's the thing to do, it's the right thing, it's the loving thing to do. Another group in the church is preaching out of envy. The other group that Paul refers to is also preaching the gospel, but they have a different motivation and goal in mind. The motivation here is envy and strife. Envy of Paul's success and renowned despite his imprisonment. I mean, at this point, Paul is the most famous Christian in the Roman Empire. There are a lot of Christians and there are a lot of churches, but he is probably the most famous one. He's the one that gets all the talk, all the attention, because he's at the, you know, he's at the pinnacle of power. I don't mean apostolic power. He's, at, he's in Rome, he's in prison, he's going to go before the, the emperor. Everybody's talking about Paul. Okay? So their motivation should be love of lost souls or the desire to serve God, but these men, Paul says, want to compete with Paul in order to get into the limelight. They want some attention for themselves. It seems that their objective was not to convert the lost, but to somehow create envy and jealousy and division in Paul's heart. They thought that Paul would react to their success as they were reacting to his. In other words, they were jealous of his success and they figured if they'd succeed, Paul would be jealous of them. The difference being that Paul was in jail and they were free. Paul doesn't denounce or even rebuke them. That's the interesting thing. He simply describes their true actions. They're motivated by selfish ambition, selfish ambition, caring only for oneself without regard to other people. That's selfish ambition and their envy of Paul's success causes them to desire his failure and suffering. I mean, these guys are a piece of work. I mean, <laughs> poor Paul's in jail and they, they want to you know, get into his head and make him miserable, make him feel jealous or envious because they may be getting to be as famous as he is, maybe you know, converting as many people as he's converted. Who knows? You know, Sinful people have been around since the very beginning. Who knows how sin you know, demonstrates itself in a person's character. So these people want the gospel to succeed and they want souls converted to Christ, but they want the credit and the renown for this success to come to them, not to Paul. So that's a bad thing. You know, we've been going uh, you know, a good thing, a bad thing, a good thing, a bad thing. So that's a bad thing that's taking place in the church. Another good thing, verse 18, he says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So Paul explains what could be a very discouraging situation, that some believers are preaching the gospel in order to provoke him to jealousy while he's in jail. That could be a very negative thing. He describes what this matter looks like and here's the key. He describes what this matter looks like through the eyes of faith. And through the lens of faith, what seems like disorder and acting with improper motives becomes an opportunity to rejoice. The word planted here, the gospel being preached, never returns empty, Isaiah 55, 11. He recognizes that if the gospel is preached, no matter who's preaching it, it'll produce results. So a person with a pure heart, completely you know, out of love, preaches the message, there'll be a return. A person preaching it because they want to make money and they want to be 
you know, but they're preaching the gospel itself, it'll bring results. It always brings results, Paul says. And he says, I'm happy for that. He understood this so that through the eyes of faith, he could and did rejoice despite these negative circumstances. So what, these guys are preaching, they're trying to you know, play with my head, they're trying to get into me, trying to make me feel bad. Who cares? <laughs> People are believing in Jesus. People are being converted. That's what's important. In verse 19, he says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul also considers his upcoming trial through the eyes of faith. He's confident that he will not be condemned, but rather be set free. And he's confident for two reasons. One, he depends on their prayers on his behalf. And he's confident that the Lord will provide him with the words and explanations and the proper responses, as well as the clear mindedness and confidence he'll need to face the highest court in the empire. I don't know about you, but I'd be a little nervous. <laughs> it's not like going before the, you know, the city traffic court, you know, cause you've been speeding and you get there and if you've ever been to court for you know, even, even a traffic ticket, you know, it's a little, little nerve wracking, right? You get there in front of the judge, you, know, you, were, you were doing 112 in a 40 zone or something. You, how do you plead? You only have one word to say, guilty. You know? Well, you know you're just going to plead guilty and then go and pay your fine. It's still pretty nerve wracking. Could you imagine being in front of the Supreme Court, defending your faith? your beliefs, the outcome being either you're freed or they cut your head off, I'd be a little nervous. But Paul is saying, I know the Philippians, I know you're praying for me, that gives me strength. And I know the Lord has promised all of us that He would give us the words, He'd give us what we needed to say in a difficult situation. And I believe it's not just you know, if you're in front of the Supreme Court like he was, I think he gives you the words and the things in the difficult situation to all of us when we face those, those times where we need to confess our faith or whatever, act according to his will. So he trusts that Jesus will deliver on the promise made to all the apostles when before kings and judges. And then in verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by my death. So his goal in facing the judges in court is not simply to be set free from prison. His goal isn't, I want, I want a, a, no, a not guilty verdict. That's, that's not his goal. Whether he's set free or not, his higher goal, again, seen through the eyes of faith, is that he not say or do anything that will undermine the gospel or dishonor Christ. They can go ahead and cut off my head, but I want to make sure that I've not said anything that will undermine the preaching of the gospel or that will dishonor Christ in any way. On the contrary, his goal is that whether he is set free or found guilty and sent to his death, in either case, Jesus will be exalted. Jesus will be honored and recognized. So this higher ideal above living or dying can only be seen through the eyes of faith. Now that Paul has updated the Philippians about the condition of his ministry, he's going to move on to describe the dilemma he faces because of the condition he finds himself in. Okay. So uh, let's see. Although these two verses here are usually separated by some kind of header in most Bibles, these two verses actually go together to form one thought. So verse 21, he says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So in verse 20, Paul states that whether he lives or dies, he wants to honor Christ. Okay, we just talked about that. In verse 21 here, he completes the thought by declaring that remaining alive continues his complete devotion to Christ and dying sends him to his reward in Christ. One way or another, it's all about the Lord Jesus. So in either situation, Christ will be the main focus of his existence, whether he continues to live and serve here, or he dies and you know, goes to be with Christ, either way. This realization, however, presents Paul with a dilemma 
which he goes on to explain. So let's read it first. He says, but if I'm to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. And so despite his dire circumstances, remember I said four years in prison, possible execution, he sees his situation in a totally positive light, no matter what happens. First, if he is freed, well then he looks forward to being active in ministry. He'll be in the capital of the world, Rome, where there has been great interest in the gospel, even at the highest level. You know, in Philippians 4.22, we'll read a little later on, he talks about Caesar's household. So there was the Praetorian guard, the elite guard, they were talking about him, and he says even into Caesar's household, Caesar's servants and assistants and so on and so forth, even they were exposed to the gospel. Okay, so he says there's a lot of work to do. In other words, the seed has been planted, people are talking, if I'm set free, I've got a lot of follow-up to do. I've got a lot of follow-up work to do, a lot of opportunities, okay? In addition to this, there are many Jews who have been converted when he first arrived, Acts 28, 24, not to mention the many Christians already in Rome. So there's lots of people out there he wants to see. He wants to get out there and preach. Now this is speculation on my part, okay? But after having been in prison for four years, he may have been anxious to minister directly to churches instead of writing them brief letters. After all, you know, the Philippian letter is just a couple, of, a couple of pages long. He was aware of the opportunities and challenges in ministry that awaited him should he be released from prison. And as an apostle, he'd naturally be excited about what could be done. Let's get out there. Things are happening. He then mentions the other option possibly facing him, and that's execution. However, he does not refer to it in negative or gruesome terms like death by crucifixion or wild animals or some other painful method to kill somebody publicly. His reference to execution simply states that its results, again seen from the eyes of faith, are positive. Should Paul be executed, it would mean a different kind of freedom. His spirit would be released from his body and his uh, life would be uh, released from the prison of his flesh to be eternally with Christ. So the choice is, I'm set free and serve Christ. I'm set free by death, I'm with Christ. Yeah. Now, being set free to be with Christ, he said this would be his personal desire because it would be better for him, very much better for him. This then is the dilemma. His desire to remain and continue his apostolic ministry or to be with Christ in heaven. He acknowledges that he desires to do both with his departure to be with Christ being the greater of the two options. He then describes the way he has settled the matter in his own heart. He says, being with Christ in heaven would serve him best. The end of work, the end of his suffering, and the end of all the demands of ministry. However, remaining would serve the church best. And he knew in his heart that this was necessary. So we read verse 25 and 26. He says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. So Paul says that he is convinced that remaining and ministering to them to grow and, and encourage their faith is more necessary and thus this is what's going to take place. This is not a prophecy here. Paul is merely stating that when regarding the two options, he's convinced as far as a faithful, experienced apostle can be sure that remaining to serve the church is the better option for now. He even looks ahead and, to, and, and describes the situation when he would finally be released and, and be physically among, among them once again. You know? His presence will strengthen their faith. His presence will bring them joy. 
His presence will enable them to be even bolder in proclaiming the gospel. So Paul describes his present condition and future hope of release to encourage the Philippians to envision a time when he will once again be with them and the positive spiritual impact that they will have on them, that his being with them will have on the church. So in the following verses, Paul will begin the major thrust of his epistle and that is an encouragement for the Philippians to pursue greater maturity in Christ. So that's, you know, this has all been the, the preamble here, the introductory material. How are they doing? I want to pray for you. This is how I'm doing. Here's my dilemma. Do I stay? Do I go? You know, this is all preamble. Uh, the next section is really the heart of the Philippian letter, the six examples of Christian uh, maturity. And we're going to start that uh, next, uh, next time. A couple of lessons, just practical lessons from the material we've covered this morning. Lesson number one, Christians should see life through the eyes of faith. Paul saw his situation through eyes of faith and in doing so could understand what really was happening. I mean, he could have said, here I am in jail, I've been falsely accused, I've been here almost four years, it's just not fair, you know, and I'm a good man and I'm a Christian and I never hurt nobody. You know, I mean, he could have done that, that's what I would have done. I've <laughs> been crying for my mama. Without faith, his condition made no sense. And it would have been very discouraging. You know, he's in jail without formal charges. He did everything right and was succeeding in his work. And all of this interrupted by false accusations and corrupt politicians. It's just not fair. I can imagine him saying, he didn't, but imagine him saying, well, here you chose me to go to the Gentiles and to establish churches, and now you're wasting four years of my life by putting me in jail on false charges. You know what I mean? Through the eyes of faith, however, Paul could see God working through his situation to make progress that he himself could not have imagined. If somebody would said to him, well, you're going to be evangelizing the Praetorian Guard. Are you kidding me? I can't even get within 10 feet of one of the Praetorian Guard. No way. These guys are way above where I am at. If somebody said, yeah, and, and you'll, you'll be preaching and explaining the gospel to the emperor of Rome, come on. But through the eyes of faith, Paul could see how God had managed the situation in such a way to do exactly that thing. You know, one prayer we often neglect to make when things don't go our way or we suffer setbacks and trials and obstacles is the one asking God to help us see things with the eyes of faith. This view from God's perspective may not change the situation itself, but it can change us and usually brings with it a sense of peace and courage. If we see what God sees, then we're in line with His vision and His will. And this knowledge is what enables us to persevere with a peaceful and a confident spirit. I, I get what God is doing here. I, I'm beginning to see what He's accomplishing with me. Again, may not change the situation, but it sure, it sure changes your head. Only two lessons. How Christians choose between right and right. Not between right and wrong, between right and right. You know, choosing between right and wrong is not always easy because knowing the right thing and doing the right thing is, is, is not always the same. At least we have many ways to discern right from wrong, even though our flesh is weak at times and following through. You know, it's like, a, I know the right thing to do and I know the wrong thing to do and I want to do the right thing, but my flesh is a little weak. You know, I, you know, I succeed maybe 50% of the time, whatever. You know. But we kind of know how to choose between right and wrong. We kind of know that. But in these passages, Paul is uh, deliberating between two things which are right. Serving the church, that's right in the name of Jesus. 
or being with Jesus. Well, that's also right. Two spiritually good and right things. A lot of times in our lives we're faced with two things and both of them are right. How do we choose then? And so the measure that Paul uses to decide which he should do if the decision and power were his is the following. He asks himself in both options, where do I rank? And Paul's answer to that was simple. Leaving to be with Christ served him first and foremost. Remaining to minister and serve Christ here, serve the church, serve the lost, and serve himself last in that order, This was the way that he chose. In that he would rejoice with these he ministered to and comfort the one in whose name he served. In other words, where his interests were last, that's what he chose. It's not the only way to help you decide between two seemingly right or good things, but it needs to be considered first. See where you rank in the things that you are choosing. This is one way of seeing things through the eyes of faith. Good things that seek the kingdom, that serve those we love and other people, that station us where we have to rely on God, those are options usually seen through the eyes of faith. The flesh will always do what takes care of number one. The flesh will always do what takes care of number one. So options that put us first, that serve mainly our interests and tend to lessen our ability to seek the kingdom, usually serve our flesh and have not been viewed from the eyes of faith. They may be good options, but they're not the best option. And my prayer many times is, Lord, show me my best option, my best option. Not just the options that'll serve me, but the best option that'll serve you and me and my family and others and the church. You know, show me that option. And usually he does. All right, well, there we go. Next week we really do start into the, you know, the meat of the matter, the six examples of Christian maturity. All right, thank you very much. That's our lesson for today. You're dismissed.